All right, um, I got a slide presentation for you. We are using the book, by the way. Quizzes quiz is on the book. It's a funny story. I about just covered what you needed up. My work lost like their one of their servers. Yeah. And I mean, I was just sitting there laughing. I was like, you should have had that backed up better. Yeah. <laughs> I've learned all about this. Yes, yes, you need to. So for two days, you, and, you know, bring up backup. I'll tell you when I learned about doing backup. I've had lots of clients who've lost stuff. One of them, I had a full backup. Then I had a differential backup, then I had incre incremental backups. If you know the differences, you should learn those. I did them all correctly. And I always tested them, you know, once in a while. I tested everything but the full backup. The full backup never completed successfully. And I, I, their accounting system got corrupted. So I restored the fold and restored it. And, and there was one call I could never get. The funny thing was, for about five years, they were like, yeah, we really need to switch to this new program. Yeah, we're gonna do it next year. We're gonna do it next year. I said, you're doing it now. <laughs> and I did. Oh my God. So, so. But no, I, when I had my house built, I uh, went into my builder and I asked about phone lines and stuff like that. And he's like, now I got a 2100 square, square foot home with four bedrooms, an office, a kitchen, and everything. And he says, I'll give you four phone lines. I'm like, four phone lines is not enough for anybody. So I ran my own. I ran 27. There's one in every wall in every room. But each place has one cat six for network, one cat five for phone. It has intercom and it has coax at every area. They were sold to a professional game. And there's, <laughs> if it's an exterior wall, they're actually ran through conduits up into the attic. So you can walk through my attic and there's a blue conduit. You just shove something down, right up there. That's and up in the attic, they're all mounted right against the, the, the bottom of the rafters. There's bridle hooks. So all the wires are perfectly separated. So you can really walk around my house. But um, I did it. What I told them was, whenever it gets to the point to add the phone lines, give me one day and I'll do it. it actually, it took about an hour and a half to run it. Because the walls were up, but there was no sheetrock yet. You see, that makes some easy. That's yeah. easy. Yeah. So, man, we did the whole house in less than two hours. We put in central vacuum. We did. I put speaker wires in every room in the ceilings. It was all perfect. And I took a picture of every single wall. So you could go in and, and every seal, you see you go in the bedroom, okay, so it's about two inches over from the light, and cut a hole, pull the wire. I lost every picture. <laughs> and I can't find them to this day. <laughs> oh, man. So I, I still look for them. Still look for them. <laughs> but that's why I, I, I pay for carbonite, because that backs up everything. Plus I have Google Drive and everything else. So, yeah. right. so let's talk about this chapter, okay? Um, but now, you said we didn't need the book. No, I said this no, class we need. Oh, no, no, wait, yeah, sorry. Right. Right. Now, I'm not a huge fan of these slides. They do have some information, in it, but they will have enough to get you what you need. Okay, I'm just, they're not the best. Okay, I did add a little bit to it, but not much. We're going to talk a little bit about TCP IP. I don't think it goes nearly in depth enough. We talked about IP addressing and number of conversions, and I'm going to show you at home. Okay, it's a protocol, okay? TCP IP is a protocol suite. It actually is a combination of a bunch of protocols. Who is HTTP and TCP and IP and ARP and SSH and all those are part of this protocol suite, okay? Stands for Transmission Control Protocol, Internet, Internet Protocol, okay? Four layers. The OSI model, which you all should have learned about the OSI model, is seven layers. But the OSI model was never really implemented. It's kind of like, this should work for everything. So then they tailored this one for the internet. So we have the network layer, internet, transport, and application. We're gonna see which on each one, okay? And I'll tell you a little bit about there. We're gonna talk more about them here in a second. Okay. So the application layer, that's our program. That's our web browsers, our mail. It's the stuff we interact with. That's the application, okay? In the OSI model, this actually includes the application and the presentation layer. If you think about it, the application handles presentation. So that's why they were combined into the application layer on the TCP model, the four layer model. Okay? So it includes all that stuff, all the, the connection from one into the other, IRC, Telnet, all that. So pretty basic stuff there. Okay. Transport layer, that's encapsulation, it uses TCP and UDP. And if you look at, let me bring up Notepad here. If we look at 
TCP UDP. Okay. With IP, you either get TCP or UDP. Okay, it's kind of like an hourglass figure here. Okay, so you get one or the other. Um, okay, it says TCP is connection oriented. Okay. Connection oriented means if I want to talk to Michael, I'm going to say, hey, Michael, I want to talk to you. Then he's going to respond back and says, okay, and Ken, I would like to talk to you too. Then I'm going to reply back and says, okay, I'll talk to you. So we bet it's a three-way handshake. I send what's called a send packet, a synchronization packet. Then he sends an act and a send, so it's called a send act. So he sends me a send. A send is a synchronization packet. What it is is a random 32-bit number that initially I picked one. I picked a random number, 32 bits in size, and I send it to Mike. Michael at that point picks another random 32-bit number for the out acknowledgement. And he also sends back my, my send packet. So he says, for this send packet, here's my acknowledgement of it. Okay. Then I take his acknowledgement increment by one and send it back. And then from then on, every time we send something, we keep incrementing the numbers by one. That way we can put the packets in order. You wonder, you know, the internet, you know, if you take your grocery cart and you put everything into separate bags, well, when you get it home, you put them all on the counter. I mean, how do you put it back in the right order? Well, the internet handles that by sequence numbers. Because we don't care if our groceries are out of order, but packets have to be out in the correct order. So it's a three-way handshake. If you do SSL, it's actually a five-way handshake because we, we include the transfer of certificates. So they say hello, and then we send certificates back and forth, and we do all that kind of stuff. Okay? So connection-oriented means it's going to get there. Okay? And there's our SYN, our SYNAC, and our ACK. Okay? UDP, I've... They don't mention it. UDP is a connection list protocol. UDP was very popular years ago for uh, video streaming, for um, mail servers, stuff like that. Because think about it, you're watching a Netflix video and you drop one packet. Who cares? <laughs> so UDP just kept sending it to you, so you kept going. But nowadays, since our networks are so good quality, they're actually most of them are TCP. A UDP, user data random protocol, is a connection list. It basically says, hey, Mike, here you go. And if you don't grab it, you miss it. And that's pretty much how it works. Okay. All right. Some critical components. In. By the way, your quiz you're going to do is actually out of the book. They ask some questions like this. What are the critical components of a TCP packet? Okay. So everything you need here. Okay. They talk about flags. You're going to do a bunch with flags in this class. It's not in this chapter yet. Flags are things like, is it a SIN packet? A flag is a binary number, one or zero. So we're gonna, when we look at flags, actually, I'm gonna show you. No, maybe I can't. Nope, don't have Wireshark, so I can't show you. Wait, did I spell that right? No Wireshark, okay. But we'll play with that later, it's not in this chapter anyway. But, the flags are a, is a single number, but when converted to binary, obviously you get binary digits, and different ones and zeros mean different things. So then you can see if it's a SYN packet, an ACK packet, a PUSH packet, a RESET packet, or a whatever packet. So those are very important. Okay, initial sequence numbers, how big are they? Size? <clears throat> Just said it. 32 bits. 32 bit. 32 bit. Yeah. Random 32-bit number, and Based on your operating system, you can kind of figure out what they're going to start with. Okay. And there's actually something called a sequence number guessing attack, which uh, I used to take care of a bunch of gyms. You know, it's called Anytime Fitness Run. I used to take care of a whole bunch of those. And we had a video, video streaming system for all the cameras in the gym, and you could remotely access it. And since we had PCI compliance, which means we took credit cards, we had to be checked every quarter. And they would always fail us on a sequence number guessing attack. But they were wrong, it wasn't there. And they gave me the wrong information. It, literally every single time I had to contact them, says, no, you're wrong, that's not what it is. First of all, even if it was, that's on a totally separate network from the credit card, so you should be checking that anyway. But I'm telling you, because if you fail PCI compliance, you no longer accept credit cards. 
every time I had to, and thank God it was there. The owner would be like, oh crap. So, but you know, it, and it, what it was is the, it was in the DVR, the video recorder, and it was never going to be updated. Because even the manufacturer says, this is a video system. So what if you guess it? The initial sequence number, it's not connected to anything else. So why fix it, you know? But uh, it was a pain in the butt. But um, also source and destination port numbers kind of important. <clears throat> You'll know, someone asked me a question about ports today. So let me explain what ports are again. I know some of you already know all this. Think of the internet like your cable TV at home. You got a cable connection and channel four is KFOR, channel five is KOCO. So you have a bunch of different channels on there. That's how the internet works. There's 65,535 65, channels or ports. And port 80 happens to be a web server. Port 25 happens to be mail. Port 22 happens to be SSH. 20 and 21 are FTP. So what that means is a packet, when it's cruising across the internet, if the destination is port 25, then where's it going? Mail. It knows to go to the mail server because the mail server is listening on port 25. But, uh, the guy in the gym asked me this morning, he says, can you change that? Yes, you can. It's like when, when I worked at Tinker, we had the Tinker webpage. Tinker.af.mem. But at the end of it, if you put colon 8080, that forced your browser to connect on port 8080 rather than port 80. Okay. Actually, no, that one was 552. That's right. Yeah, if you put in Tinker.af.mem colon 552, that connected to the 552nd Squadrons page. If you put in colon 752, it would have been the 750 seconds. It's like um, Westlaw, the thing they use in the legal program. That only works on port 88. So you have to go to westlaw.com, colon 8080, and connect up. You can change those very easily, but you have to let people know. Like if Westlaw never told people to connect to port 80, if you go on westlaw.com, you'd be like, it's not working. So but when I ran my business for years, Rose State blocks a lot of ports. They even block outbound ports. So how do I connect out when they block ports? So what I did is I scanned the Rose State Network and I found the outbound ports that were available. We had 80, 80, 80, we had 53. Still don't know what 53 does. So what I did was on the other end in my house where I bought, first of all, if you have Cox, I'm assuming we have Cox at home, they, I'm not, I haven't verified this, but they, at least for a long time, did not allow port 80 into your house. So you cannot run a web server in your house. I'm assuming it's still that way. <clears throat> so how are you going to run a web server at your house if you can't run it on port 80? Well, you change it to port 53. Then whatever you want to connect to, you type in Ken Dewey's house, call it 53, and it connects right in. So, actually, let me see if I have any up in my house still. I had a bunch of stuff up that way. Let's see if 53 is still up. Now, let's try... 8080. Yeah, I don't remember what the darn. No. Oh, maybe I got something at 8080. It's not coming up. Yeah, see, I got rid of most of my stuff that needed it. No, 20's not up. 8080. Yeah, because I've been getting rid of everything. I can't show it to you, but you know, I don't use it anymore. And like when I was submitting uh, some paperwork to the NSA, I had to all this stuff. Well, that had to connect on a specific bizarre port like 1294. Like, why? They just want a port that just not the normal person has been even know about. So I would, I actually had to get with Rose State and said, hey, I have to connect to the NSA on this port. And what they ended up doing was they ended up setting up a proxy server for me. So what that did was I would connect internally to the proxy server, and then the proxy server would connect out on that weird. Okay, so port's kind of important. You need to know, we're gonna see some more about them in a second. But, uh, and basically source and destination are different. When you're trying to connect to a web server, we're connecting on port one. What's the web server? 80, port 80. So I'm going outbound on port 80, but is it leaving my computer on port 80? No. It's leaving a, on a number greater than 1024, a random picked number. Then it connects to Google on port 80. Then they reply back to my port, whatever that happens to be. Okay. So uh, TCP headers abused by hackers. They can do all kinds of stuff with them. Okay. We're going to look more at headers later. Okay. Here's what 
what a normal header looks like. We have a source port and destination port. We have the sequence numbers. And there's the flags, urgent, ACK, um, push, reset, send, and uh, fin. Those are the flags. Now I'm going to show you on an actual packet of how they work. Okay? And you're going to be doing a lot more with them later. Okay? We also have um, you know, checksum. What checksum is, take the header and do a mathematical calculation on it and store it there. It's kind of a way of checking if it's been messed with. Urgent pointer not really used anymore, and then some options and pattern to make it the right size. Okay, that's what it looks like, and we're going to look more into that. Here's what the flags are. I told you what they are, but they're either on or off, and you can manipulate that. There's a program out there. I have not used this in a project in a long time. It's called ping cell ping right h ping three. You go up here to HPing3. That is a crazy program. Is this HPing3? That's not HPing3. Not HPing. I guess it's just in Cali. Okay. And HPing3, you can tell it to send out forty thousand packets in one second with random source addresses, all going to a single destination. So you can. I tried, when we originally were going to use it for a project, I had a Linksys router. And I told the students, run HBIN3, start it, and control C and stop it immediately. But still, in one second, it's on 40, it kills the router instantly. So I reset it, boom, dead again. It's like, it's so I ended up getting a Cisco router and that worked fine. But try that with your home router. That sucker will be offline instantly. Mine's all fine enough the way it is. Yeah. I don't need to help. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So what it does is it sends out packets to a specific destination, but the source, it gives a bogus address. So your router is trying to reply back to an address that ain't valid. So then that basically bounces back to your router and it's like, ah. So, but you can do all kinds of stuff with that. You can forge everything using HP3. Okay. How do you test your firewall? Some way to test it with it. Uh, no, you're not going to test it with it. No. Yeah. That's more of a malicious tool. That's what it is. Yeah, I'm going to bring down. So the flags, again, we're going to play more with those later. Sequence number. Oh, yeah, it's a 32 bit number. Receives yes. notes, blah, blah. I already told you how that works. It gets implemented so we keep track of our packets. So, yeah. So then step one and two of the hedge. Wow, I even said that right. So, okay. So, okay. All right, packets. Two 16-bit fields, because they can be up to 65,535. They're logical, not physical. It's not a connection. It's not a new plug in your computer. Can you imagine if you had 65,535 plugs? So, no, that's not good. HTTP uses 80. This helps you stop or just say, you can turn that stuff up. Let me show you something. I don't know if y'all know how to do this. I'm going to bring up the command prompt. And I'm going to type next stat dash a. Next stat dash a. What it's doing is it queried my computer, and it's seeing I'm listening on a bunch of ports. See those at the top? That means my machine got its ear open on 135, which is that file, it's very good. It's got a, how about 445, Active Directory, very good. Then it's got a whole bunch of random other ports because we're running different programs on here. So it's got 3389 open, what do you think? Anybody? Remote desktop, very good. Um, but you know, I showed Don the email I got today, or yesterday, wow. They, they caught me at work surfing porn. I accidentally <laughs> clicked the button, installed their software, oh, God. and they've captured everything. So I need to pay them 330 bitcoins immediately. Uh, or they they have my contacts, they have all my files. Don't 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 go, what is it? Don't go cops. Yeah, don't go, don't they go not find me or something. <laughs> <laughs> they can't find me. They said, you want proof? We'll send to eight of your friends. And then you ask them. Right. <laughs> Whatever. But you know, the thing is, they said they did it via RDP. RDP is 3389. So technically, there's a slight possibility they could have done it on this machine. Okay. 
but you go home, run that stat dash A. See if you got RDP running on it. If you do, why? I mean, if something's open and you don't know what it's for, figure it out. If it doesn't need to be open, turn the darn thing off. Okay? We need it open here because I connect in a lot from my office. Okay? But I don't need RDP at home. You know, so, yeah. but it's just funny how some of these things. Now, what is established? Established means there's an actual connection open. So I have an HTTPS connection, and I don't know exactly where I'm going to with this. I don't know what that number is. Yeah, establishes, yeah, I'm talking to them. This is me over here on this port. I'm talking to one of our domain controllers. I'm talking to Juno and Venus and Pluto and Plexus or a file server. I'm talking to Zoom. Got a connection open to Zoom, okay? Yeah, talking a bunch of stuff there. Okay, and I'm listening on a bunch of other stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. So, what? Okay. Well, one way you can do it. Let me go to. Uh, oh, I can't do it on this machine. Can I go to computer management, maybe. Oh, I can. Okay. What I can do is I could go over here to services. I could go way down to the bottom and I could find remote desktop and I could say remote desktop services. I could open this up and I could stop it. I could disable it. I could do whatever I want. If you change it, if you stop it and change it to disabled, it won't start again. If you stop it and don't disable it, I mean, it can be started again by some other patient or some other person. Yeah, so now it's a good idea to look into this stuff. If you don't know, I mean, what? Yeah, so how do we find out what the heck runs on what port? So I'm going to go to C Windows System 32 Drivers. Y'all should know this, it's like intuitive. Drivers, etc. Okay, C Windows System 32 Drivers, etc. And if you open up a file in here called services, let's open that up. It'll actually tell you what every port is. So you can look through here. <coughs> and it'll tell you like 3389, let's find that. 3389 right here. WBT, oh, it's right below. No, it's, it's remote desktop. Why is it called WBT server? It's remote desktop, I know this. I don't know why it's called that. But um, it can be changed. Like I said, you can change ports you know, to do different things. When I first got hired, um, I, I had a consulting business and I would take care of machines all the time, all over the city. What I did is I configured all their remote desktops to answer on port 21, because we had that open here. So then I configured mine to connect out on 21, which is normally FTP. So then I would literally, connect remotely to their machines on port 21 using a remote desktop and fix their stuff. And it was funny because our network admin at the time, he knew what I did. He didn't care. I wasn't causing any problems. He's like, man, can you FTP all day long for hours at a time? I said, yeah, I, know. I like it. So. so that's a good place to find out what services are. Whenever you do that, does it still use FTP on that port too? Or is it no, it does not. Can't have two things. So you reassign it to a different one? Yeah. So what I would normally do though is I connected into their gateway server on port 21 with remote desktop. Then from there went to the individual machine inside. <laughs> Was it the best way to do it? No. But but it worked. Okay. All right, so we have our ports, so we can stop. So turn off stuff you don't know of. Now here's what I recommend. If you're gonna start turning off stuff, be careful. <laughs> Don't have your active school project open. That's not been saved. Because you could, I, I, like a lot of times when I'm trying to remove viruses and you're not sure what that process is, you kill it, boom, oh man, the machine reboots or something. You know? So be careful with that. Okay. There's only the first 10, 23 ports are considered well known, the rest are not. You can go to IANA and also find out what those are. Just because they're well known, you can't use them for other stuff. Like I said, you can change them. Okay, 2021 or FTP. Okay, requires a login. 
It's clear text, and I'll show you a demo. Actually, let me show you. No, I don't have Wireshark. I don't need it. I can't. Yeah, but I have to reboot. I don't want to do that. Okay. TFTP, more secure, Trivial FTP, which uses port 69. Is that right? Nobody knows? I think it's 69. We'll look up in a minute. Okay. Okay, and there's someone connected on an FTP site. Port 25 is mail. Simple mail transfer protocol. 53 is DNS. Which is actually both TCP and UDP, believe it or not. Uh, 69 TFTP, I was right. There it is, right there at the bottom. 80 is our web server, 443 is our secure web server. So I was configuring, I also took care of all the Buffalo Wild Wings around the city years ago, and they hired me to install wireless. So if I want to have a free wireless for Buffalo Wild Wings and want to make it as secure as you can, what ports do you think I have to have open? I want people to surf the web and check their email. 80, 80 obviously. 80 and 25. 80 and 25. And? What about 443? 443, because we're going to have to have secure. So 80, 25, 443, I did that. Hit save, didn't work. No, I had everything. Well, we need to be able to resolve names. Like, you know, www.google.com, you need 53. So I had to have 80, 443. 53 and uh, 125. Yeah. So, and also 110 if these pop, pop three. So, yeah, yeah there's pop three. Uh, pop three, we don't use it a lot anymore. See, SMTP, which is 25 over here, that's used to send the mail. So, if I'm going to send you all mail, it goes to my mail server and goes out using SMTP. I don't know, if you're in forensics and you read those headers, sometimes it'll say via ESMTP or whatever. So 25 is to send it out. 110 is to retrieve it. But most of us now use web-based mail, and that uses like 983. I think it's Google and other stuff like that. So, the old ways to do it were you actually connected and downloaded all the mail. That was on port 110. Yeah. Uh, 119, news. Does anyone have a news server anymore? No. Okay. 135, that's our RPC. 139, NetBIOS. So we're... 143 is IMAP4, so again, that's the main change. Okay, UDP says operates the transport layer, used for speed. It really doesn't care who you are. It doesn't bear, it doesn't do that three-way handshake. So it's a little bit better, okay? Yeah, they, yeah, like you said, Netflix and YouTube used to use that just for it. Yeah, they, they don't, they, our networks are so fast now anyway. I got the 300 meg at home, I don't even know why. Uh -huh. It's, oh well. Fiber, right? Yeah, okay. nothing ever buffers in my house, though. That's good. I'm just upset they put a cap on us. Oh, I know, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Sucks. Yeah, me and my parents, uh, we had to fight over them because of since they put the cap on us, we had to fight for them to take off the cap, and we paid a teeny bit more to bump us up to 300. Uh, well, I'm I paid to remove the cap as well. And then I went to all my cameras. So I have like nine or ten cameras in stream video. I put all of them at maximum quality. I'm using the hell out of them. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, I am using more data in a week than you can use in your entire time. So yeah, basically, oh yeah, you want to put a cap on your camera? I'll just use all of your data. Exactly what I did. I'm going to go buy more cameras. <laughs> okay. So the internet layer. So the internet layer handles routers. So let's use the analogy of the postal service. Okay. What part of the postal service do you think the TCP is? The drivers. They make sure it gets delivered to the correct address. They're the, but the IP is the address in the scheme. Okay. Just because you have IP, it still needs TCP to make the connection and make sure it gets there. But IP is the addressing itself. We can use ping, we can use trace route. Y'all seen ping before? Let me show you because you haven't. I don't know what some of you have seen. So, uh, BS 10. Okay. What I'm doing now is I'm pinging my office. I send a packet to my office and said, Hey, Ken's office, you be there? Yep, I'm there. Ken's office. And I could actually do it with a dash T and it will literally go forever. And I can do the dash L and change the size of the packets. And years ago, you could do a denial of service instead. Yeah, totally fair. 
But they really, our networks are so fast now that, you know, we're streaming this right now. So we should have some network utilization. Do you all agree? We should. Let's look. Network utilization, 1%. And that's not, we're not even on a gigabit connection because we're going through the darn phone. So, I mean, that's nothing. Yeah, so, must have done something. All right. Um, trace route, on the other hand, see what ping does is it makes a connection. For me to Don and back, okay? For me to Colt, whatever. Okay. <laughs> trace route, ask me how we got there. How'd you get there? I can't demo that because. Rows blocks pings in and outside of the network. Like, like yeah, it goes up to 30 hops. Yeah. What it does, actually, we're gonna, you know, let me get to the next slide. Okay. okay. This talks about different results from ICMP. Okay. Here's how trace routes work. Okay. We send a packet, say we're gonna go to Google. Okay. I want trace route will tell us how we get to Google. It'll literally show every hop. It'll show from this computer to the router upstairs, then from the router to the firewall, the firewall to one net. It'll literally show you the entire map of how to get there. So how that does it is, let me find which one it is. Okay, it sends a packet to Google with type code 11, okay? Basically it sets it to one, one hop, okay? It gets to the first router, and it's been exceeded, so the router goes back to that, we're out of time, so you're out. In other words, your, your TTL, your time to live is normally up to 128. They set it at one, so it gets their first router, the router replies back, time exceeded, which is number 11. So it's like, well, I'm not forwarding on. So then it sends it back to us and say you're exceeded. So I write that down, okay, number one was this route. Then I send it to Google with TTL of two. So it goes through the first router to the second router. Well, got this, you know, every time it goes through a router, it gets decremented. Gets in the second router, it's like, oh, time exceeded, it sends back code 11. I'm like, aha, now you're router number two. Then it sends it with router number three, and so on and so forth. And it says it only does 30. The problem with that is, could the network topology change while I'm doing it? It actually could. A link could go down somewhere. So, yes, it could change. But that's what these things are. They're, it's the, the ICMP. Results that you can get. Okay. Okay. There's a whole bunch of them. All right. IP addressing. I'm not a fan of the way they did it here. IP4 is in four octets. So if I go over here and I do an IP config, you see my address is 10.55.10.87. Okay. They're called octets. So the 10 is one octet, the 55 is one octet, and so on and so forth. Okay. They're octets because they're made up of eight bits. Eight is oct in German. It's an easy way to remember, but that's how I can remember. All right, so, um, so these, you, what the class, so you see this class ABC thing, what that is, that's the first part of the address, that first number. Depending on what it starts with, I put the numbers. Like our network here is a 10, starts with a 10. So which type of network should it be? Should be an A. You all agree? Yes. Okay. Uh, my house is a 66, so it should be a A. A is for very large networks. The 60 million people, 60 million addresses. So why? No question? Yeah, why is yours a 66? I'm gonna get there in a second. Okay. So yours is probably a 66 as well. If you have Cox, it's a 66. Okay. Well. The original plan was A's are for large networks, okay, like HP. HP is one of the largest networks in the world. Okay? Class B is for medium-sized networks. So class A means the first octet identifies the network, the other three is known. Class B, medium networks, the first two octets identify the network, the last two are for the host. Class C networks are for small networks like ISPs. First three identifies the network, <coughs> And the last one is the host. Okay. So there's also D and E, which I didn't even mention. Okay, there's something, something missing in C, right? Yeah, it's oh, sorry about that. It's actually 192. My bad. Sorry. It's 192. Okay. 192 is a. We're going we're gonna to get to 192 in a second. Yeah, sorry about that. 
Okay. They didn't have any, and I tried to add it. But they, they, they would have something on the next slide. But they is multicast. Let me explain what multicast is. Say we got machines in all over this room. We got 28 machines in here. Now, if I want to image all of them, I want to send each of them a 40 gig image. Can you imagine me sending 40 gigs to that one, 40 gigs to that one, 40 gigs to that one? That's a lot of 40 gigs. Multicast, we can basically say, okay, everybody, wake up. Here it comes. <laughs> and I'll send it out, and you all catch it at one time. I'm really only sending out one time. And trust me, it makes, we used to image our labs upstairs and they would take days sometimes. When we set it up correctly and when multicast was working, an hour and a half you're done, the entire lab. So it really makes it, it is experimental. I've never really done anything with it. Okay. Why can't I pick on this? Okay. So class A, well, they do say it's 192, but it's, we're going to see more about that in a second. Uh, I added the bottom part. Okay. There's also private addresses. Did I talk, was that, did I talked about that in this class? No, the other class. Okay. Private addresses are addresses that are made for internal use only. Like 10. You saw my address started with 10. Your home routers are most likely 192.168, correct? Those are private, in other words, they are non routable. Right. If you try to use a 10 address, so if you went to your house and could figure the external part of your router is a 10, it won't go nowhere. So they just won't router. They'll hit a router and be like, go away. Okay. So 10, 172.16, and 192.168 are all private. Okay. That's why we use them internally. It's like all the computers at Rose State are all configured. It says 10s. They hit a firewall and get converted through NAP to a 19, uh, one. What is our number here? Is it 162? Let's find out. We're going to find out. We're going to go over here to our favorite address, IP Chicken 164. Okay. You're close. You're close. And what it uses is something called NAT, which I don't think they're going to talk about this in here. The way NAT works is my packet, like I just went to IP Chicken. So since I have an internal address, it sent it over to the gateway. And the gateway says, hey, we got Ken Dewey over here who wants to go to IP Chicken. <coughs> So it takes that packet, puts it in a NAT table, and says, okay, packet with this sequence number came from this specific machine. It removes the source, replaces it with itself. Then it sends the packet out to IP chicken. And since the source it came from was the router, it comes back to the router with the results. And then look, okay, that sequence number came from here, and then it forwards it back to me. It does that for everything on campus. Very quickly, obviously. Okay. So, private addresses are good. Okay. When I, uh, I, I told one class this, but uh, when I was first setting up my ISP with Cox at home, my internal addresses were 66, 210, 163, because I was running an ISP. Okay. I needed live addresses. So, but my external public side was 192, 168. I'm like, what? Literally, the girl configuring the router, I'm like, why are you giving me a private address externally? She said, it's external to you, but it's still internal to us. Which is true. So, in, so technically, Row State could actually use a 10 address externally between us and one night. They could. They could if they wanted to. But they didn't. So it makes sense, though. My internal address to Cox, now once it hit their router, then it external that but why why waste good addresses internal between me and them so it makes sense so all right all right ip addressing i said four bytes and an octet equal to eight bits okay all right we have class a used for very large networks very few of them okay we have class b divided equally the first two of the network i kind of mentioned that and we have class c First three are the network, and the last one is the number of hosts. Now, someone asked a question, why the heck do I have a 66? Well, the problem is we ran out of addresses. There are absolutely no more addresses in the entire world. So what do they do? We'll convert to IPv6. But still, before that, what they did was they said, this whole class thing is stupid. So what they did was Cox is a very large network. So Cox is providing me an address on their network. And they have a large network, so that's why it's a 66. 
So mine's small, but really, if you think about it, I'm part of COPS. So that's why they have a large name. Okay, make sense? That answer your question? Okay. Um, CIDR, which, do they cover that in this one? Okay, I think we can get there. Right. Subnetting helps us divide up our networks. And if I went into IP config here, okay. You'll see the middle line of the address. It shows a subnet of 255.255.254.0. Okay, that's my subnet mass. Think of a subnet mass like a zip code. Okay, it, it tells you what part is the city. It's like I live on Treeline Drive, but believe it or not, there's a Treeline Drive in Salt Lake City, Utah as well. There's actually an 84 Treeline Drive. So if I didn't specify, see now when I type it, it automatically goes to Charleston. But if you guys were to type in 8412 Treeline Drive, it'll probably default to Salt Lake City, Utah. It was the local one. It was? Okay. Yeah. But depending on where you are, because you probably typed in 84. Probably. But so the subnet mask is like the zip code in the city. It says in Choctaw, Oklahoma. Okay. The 255, 255, 254, what that is, is that's converted to binary. Y'all know what binary is? Ones and zeros. So 255 is what, anybody? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's our sudden and mass converted to binary. Okay. I do? Check out that middle one. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Yeah, this is the expanded version. <laughs> <laughs> this is the plus size. <laughs> okay, um, if you convert my network to binary, then what you do is you just line it up. <laughs> Wherever the ones are, that's the network. Wherever the zeros are, that's the host. It's that simple. It's exactly how it is. Um, I was uh, originally a, uh, a jet engine mechanic. I don't know if you all know. I went over, over to the Persian Gulf War. This is in 1990 when we had no nothing over there, and a computer got infected with a virus. And they're like, "Crap! What are we going to do? It's going to take two weeks to get the guy over." And it was the one computer that controlled the entire Air Force in Saudi Arabia during the war. So I told the colonel, "Let me look at it." He was like, "You're a jet engine mechanic." Come so, so I, I stayed there for the next 40 hours, and you know, and I rewrote the software. I'd never seen it in my life, but I figured it out. It wasn't that hard. It was. I think it was written in Clipper. I don't know, but I rewrote it, got it working. And the colonel was like, what the hell are you doing fixing jet engines? But then he left. But I came back to Ticker, and hour one on the job, they're like, no, 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 you come over here to computers. And they literally just grabbed me. But then they ended up forcing me into the network shop. They did not like it. Imagine if you all were in the network shop, okay? You know, our best buddies. Y'all sucked at your job. But y'all were there. <laughs> then all of a sudden, the, the commander comes over, says, here, this is Ken Dewey. He's going to tell you how to do your job. So you know how well they like it. <laughs> they hated my guts. Well, they, this one building, 224, was having a problem. They couldn't talk. It was very many. They couldn't print. They couldn't do nothing. And the network shop guys, they were over there for days. And they're like, all right, since you're the damn smart, you go look at it. So I went over there and I look at it. And the suddenly mask at every machine was different. It's like a zip code. So I'm like, why are these different? Well, they don't matter. You put whatever you want there. I said, let's try putting the same one. <laughs> Ta-da! The entire place started working. So they, so the people in the office were like, well, you're a genius. And not in the network shop, but the people that had the problem thought it was a genius. They had a problem again when I was gone on vacation. They're like, no, no, we'll work again. <laughs> so yeah, it was, yeah, a lot of problems like that. But that was Everybody the funniest subject. <laughs> It's like, why are they different? Well, they said it doesn't matter. It's obviously, they don't know what they're doing. So, okay, a sudden and mask, you know, kind of important. Helps us divide our network from our hosts. Okay. All right. And again, they have to be the same way. Okay. Here's an example. So there is 128, 214, or whatever, into binary. So if we took the subnet mask in this case of 255.255.255.0, which is a class C subnet mask. If we lined it all up, basically all the way, don't I have a pen down here somewhere? I think I have a, don't I have a pen? Any? I guess we would run it and then there's, there's a couple, but yeah, you have, oh, oh. where the E is, is where your pen is. Ah, right there. Uh, there we go, we'll get a red pen. Let's get a 
pen. So bet um, where did my pen go? There. So basically, that is my network. So my network ID ends up being 128.214.18.0. And then I am computer 16 on the network. Okay, see so how that works? The ones tell you what part is the network ID. The zeros tell you the part of the computer or the host number. Okay. So how many hosts can I have on this network? Well, how many zeros do I have on my subnet mask over here? I have eight right here. You see that there's eight. So you go two to the eighth, which is 256. Okay. So two to the eighth is 256. You can't use the first one, you can't use the last one. See so if you get 254. The first one is what's called the network ID. It's kind of like Treeline Drive. Can you send mail to Treeline Drive? No, that's the name of the street. The last one is like the broadcast address. That's kind of like rural route 12, which means give it to everybody in the whole damn neighborhood. So you can't use the first one because it's the network ID. You can't use the last one because it's the broadcast. Now you guys did learn all this already. That's just a little bit of a refresher, okay? So there's the host part, and let's see if that's actually correct. Now, I can take my calculator here and go to programmer mode, and I'm going to go to decimal, or I'm sorry, binary. One, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. And I can click on decimal, and it is indeed 16. And in hex, it would be 10, and octal, 20. Talk more about that in a second. All right. So far, so good. Um, under my YouTube channel, under CIT 1503 Networking, chapter, I think it's four and 10. I think I cover I, subnetting in like it's probably seven hours of recording time. I go over ever and ever and ever and ever. Arlene has a bunch as well. So she does the same way I do. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Okay. CIDR. So once they realized this whole A, B, C, D, E thing was stupid, they came up with classless interdomain routing. Classless means we're not gonna care about the class anymore. We're just gonna worry about numbers. Think about it. Class A networks, there's very few of them, but they're huge. Okay. Class C networks, there's lots of networks, but they're small. Well, what if we needed more big networks and didn't have enough numbers? So what are you gonna do, just give you two Bs or something? I mean, so it was a stupid idea to begin with. Kind of like the old 640K to RAM. And I remember wiring the network shop at Building 230 on Tinker with a thick net, big yellow cable. It supports 100 connections and that's it. You actually have to take a tool and drill a hole into it and put a vampire tap on and they couldn't be, it was like 10 feet apart. There was a, there was a limit on the spacing. There wasn't this nice little stuff like we got here. I mean, it sucked. We switched to ArcNet. ArcNet was great. You can only support 254 computers on the network. And that's just not. So things have changed. So IPS classes are gone. We went to classless interdomain routing. And the way you identify that is the subnet or the, the network ID, like this case, it's 192.168.1.0, and the number of ones. So 24 ones would be 255, 255, 255, 0, 8, 16, 24. It's just an easier way to write it out. Depending on the equipment you work on, like uh, I know um, uh, Netgear routers years ago, commercial versions required CRDR notation. I don't know which ones they went for. Um, actually, a student came by just before class, was talking to Jimmy, and Jimmy gave him a network, kind of like right here, and said, Give me the sudden mask and CRDR notation. The student said 24. That means nothing. The 24 is just the number of ones, but what network does it belong to? Okay. If we just asked how many ones, that would have been fine. But if we give you an IP address up there, that written in CRDR notation would be 124.214.018.0, because that's the network ID of that network, slash 24. So it's important to be precise and provide all the information. Here we go, tells you all about it. 24, yeah, class C network, 254 hosts. Two to the eighth is 256, you can't use two of them, 10 to the 254. 
And I made a real nice spreadsheet. It's actually a computer in the other room. If you don't want it, I can get it for you. I taught this in Cyber Patriot the other weekend, so okay. And the rest of them, planning your IP address. Okay. Normally you don't have to worry about it because someone else does it for you, or the network's already in place. Um, but you have to figure out how many hosts you need. Because remember that last part with the number of zeros. So if there's eight zeros. So that means two to the eight is 256. I can only use 254. So how many configures can I have on the network? 254. That's it. It's funny. I worked at KeyTech Internet, and what it was is the guy who did everything sold out to his girlfriend, and she knew no more than this bottle of water. And so she hired me real quick. Ken, we need you now. So they paid me good money, but. They sold internet, they sold uh, DSL. Well, we sold eight addresses. So I'm like, you can't sell eight addresses. Because, you know, it's two to the third is eight. You all agree? Two times two times two. Okay. So if I'm selling you eight addresses, but you can't use the first one and the last one, so how many do you truly get? Six. Six. But that's the way they were selling it. Like, you can buy eight addresses. I'm like, no, that's not eight, that's only six. But they were selling it as eight. I'm like, okay, fine, we'll sell it as eight. And one of the customers called me one day and goes, I bought eight. I said, I know. And I only got six. I said, I know. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I went in there, I gave them uh, 64. I said, is that better? <laughs> For the same price of eight. So it was, it's just, you know, she didn't have a clue what she was doing. And it was so crazy. It's like, you can't sell eight addresses. It's impossible to sell eight addresses. Okay? Just say, yes, we can. Just, no, we can't. I could sell eight individual non-consecutive addresses, but I could not sell eight consecutive addresses. Because if you figure the ones and zeros, figure, okay, if I, if I had two zeros, that's two times two is four. If I can't use the first and the last, I only get two. So you get two or you get six. Don't get eight. But yeah, it was the funniest job I ever had. And yeah, but I'll tell you more about that some other time. Okay, but planning it's kind of important. Every computer has to have an address. Every computer needs a gateway. Like we need a doorway. A gateway is like a door to this room. Okay, can you have more than one gateway? Yeah. No, not at the same time. Okay. Not the same. Like we have two doors. Technically, we shouldn't have two doors. But you know, when I took care of the network at the, so I used to take care of the Mary the Cox Convention Center and the Ford Center and all that. It was funny because the reason it's called Cox Convention Center is Cox provides internet for free. They sell it, I mean, to the people that use it, but the place there gets it for free. Well, the Cox Convention Center, they connect everything through an ISDN line, at least it did, I don't know if they do anymore, to Pennsylvania. So a 172.16 address, so everything routes through there. That's where all the management functions of the Cox Center happen. Well, when Cox came out there, they're like, here you go, here's fiber for free. Well, the problem was you can only have one gateway. And they had to connect through the ISDN line to connect to their stuff. So what we, they were doing was they would go into the windows, point to the gateway in Philadelphia, do their stuff. Okay, now I'm going to start the internet. Okay, reconfigure the gateway to point to Cox, send that out. Okay, now it's reconfigured so I can sell another ticket. And reconfigure it. Oh my God, it was a pain in the butt. So what I did was I'm like, why don't we go into the Cox router and tell the Cox router to send everything out to Cox, except unless it wants to go to 172. Then send it over that way. No, like it can't be done. Yeah, it works fine. They were fine. They still use it today. So what I did was I said, okay, send everything out through that door. But if it happens to be going to this one specific place, I put in the static router, so send it through that door. So every pack would head over to that door. Oh, you need to go to Philadelphia? Okay, go that way. That worked like a champ. So I did that for the insurance commission as well. But it's, uh, you know, I don't know. But one gateway, one on each, you know, one IP address on each, gateways, forwards, packets, so on and so forth. Okay, IPv6, they really don't give you much information here at all. IPv6 is just a very large address space, okay? 128 bit, there's enough addresses to cover every square inch of the earth and the moon. It's still not right. Okay. 
you submit it out, you actually would get 50,000, I think it's like 50,000, 50 billion addresses each person. It's like a crazy <laughs> number. They went way overkill. But, you know, yeah. on out. Someday in the far, 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 far future, that will not be enough. And if you, re yeah, if you read online, there's some stuff. The, the, the beauty of IPv6, 100% backwards compatible with IPv4. 100%. You read online somewhere and they're like, no, now you have to redesign every single network, change every piece of hardware in the entire world. And now you're in trouble. But 100% backwards <laughs> competitive. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about numbering systems. These next couple slides are the worst slides I've ever seen in my life. They're terrible. Okay. Well, y'all know what decimal is. So we start at zero, we get up to nine. What happens? We change the zero, the nine to a zero, because we reached our maximum number, and we increment the next digit. Make sense? So then we got nine, uh, we got ten. Then we go change the zero all the way up to nine again. Up, oh, we're at our maximum number. Change the nine back to zero and increment one to a two. So now I'm at ninety-nine. So I change the right-hand one to a zero, increment up. Oh, that one's at nine. So change that one to a zero, increment, and get a hundred. We've done that a whole lot. That's how binary works. Start at zero, go to one. Oh, we're at our maximum number. So change it back to zero, increment the next number. So we end up with, here's my notepad. So here's binary. Let's uh, get down here. So we got zero, then one. So what's the next one? Zero. Oh, binary here? Binary. Oh, okay. One zero, and then what? One one. One one, then? One zero zero. One zero one. Zero, one. See how that works? Yes. It's the same thing we did in decimal, but we don't have to worry about two numbers. Isn't this easier? It's a lot better. I mean, if you think about it, we're on the stupid imperial system, 5,280 feet per mile. Why? That's stupid. Yeah. How many ounces in a pound? 16 ounces, but you know, eight ounces in this and two ounces. Why don't we switch to the damn metric system? Because America wants to test the other market stuff. Exactly. It's stupid. You know, I spent seven years in Europe. You learn in the day. Once you're there, Virginia, I took over to Spain. She's like, I'm never going to be able to talk. Two minutes later, Dulce Vesa before her. We had two beers. You know, pretty simple. <laughs> you learn pretty quick. But uh, once you start using it, it's simple. Okay, so that's binary. So the first one up here, where's my mouse? So that's one. This is two. That's three. That's four, five, six, seven, eight, so on and so forth. Okay. Now let's do octal. There. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten. We only use zero seven in octal. Eight digits. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, twenty. So that works. Not hard. Okay. All right, now we get to the fun one. I'm gonna go, here's hex, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F, 10, 11, 12, blah, 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 one F, then 20. I just didn't put all the ones in between. Okay. I just didn't put in the 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 1E. You see how that works? It's, okay, decimal numbers take up too much space. They do. And if we're trying to represent them in a computer system, don't we want smaller? And this is why most computer systems use binary and hex. Right. And hex, binary because it's on or off. Hex because we can represent large numbers and divisible by eight. I mean, it's yeah, it's easy. So, not hard to do. Okay, you can look through these slides, and I also have recordings on how to do this. I have much better recordings online too. If you want to watch, look at those. Okay, um, we're about we're running out of time, so I'm going to. Yeah. Oh, who cares about nibbles? We're going to talk more, more about. High order bits and low order bits later. We're going to talk about little Indian, big Indian, and all that. We're going to cover that in another chapter. Okay. Um, review. Yeah. So, oh, here, here's this is something cool. Unix. 
you're configuring follow permissions like 457 and 777, salt on an octal. So there are uses for this stuff. But until you actually have to use it, you're never going to remember it anyway. But in the meantime, your calculators will do it for you. Okay. All right. And let's, okay, we're done with this. So I'm going to stop this recording and start another one. Okay. So let me go up here or